Um, so I'm going to pick up right where I left off last week. Uh, since I post recordings, I don't do a whole lot of review, as you've experienced. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, dealing with pattern matching, dates, and numbers. Um, I'm going to talk about aliases and the basics of joins. And that should get you through lab 7 no problem and most and partway through lab 8. Um, next week I'll be finishing off join subqueries and aggregates. So those are the two chunks I'm covering. It's just not quite in the order I wanted to do it originally. But that's okay. And depending on how fast this goes, maybe I'll be able to throw some of that stuff into this week's lecture also. All right. So... Once again, I'm working with the ThinkCube database, so for those of you that decide to try to type along, you can. This is what I did last week. I showed you guys select star from customers. And I also showed you a single criteria such as this. So if I'm targeting a single set of criteria, so that's a basic SQL statement that retrieves one row. I also showed you guys how to do the between which would have been about the 43 minute mark on last week's recording. I'm picking up right from here and I'm going to talk about specific uh, things you can use. And the first one I'm going to talk about is pattern matching. Now to explain in plain English what pattern matching me means is you are going to take um, a pattern of information and you're going to match up to strings. For example, a pattern of information might be like an email address. What's an email address? It's something, at sign something, period, something. That's a pattern. So therefore you want to match those. Uh, matching names, you just want to match a partial name. So if you're looking for Dan, but you want to catch all the Dan, the Daniels, the Daniels, the Dannys, you know, the Jordans, that's kind of stuff all the different versions of it, you'd use pattern matching. Now, as those of you that have already taken on Lab 7 have discovered that Postgres is very, very much case sensitive. It's a, just a little case sensitive. And the funny thing is, is about half the database servers out there are case sensitive and half aren't. Why are they case sensitive or not? Design decisions. Um, it is easier to go from case sensitive to treat it as not case sensitive as it is to go from not case sensitive to try to be case sensitive. Uh, why is that? Most database servers have provide tools to mess with the case of a string, but those that are case insensitive don't have an easy way for you to be specific about what letter you want to, to nail. So for example, you're trying to go after D, uppercase D and lowercase D is not the same thing. As far as the database is concerned, they're two different things. And technically, they're 27 numbers apart inside the ASCII chart, just so you know. All the, if I remember, it's all the upper cases, then it's all the lower cases that's offset. So it's challenging. So how does Postgres handle this? You have a few choices. One is you can make the matches case insensitive. And if I'm going to do a pattern match and be case insensitive, what I want to do is Postgres has a specific operator, whoops, now let's go name. Like this. So Postgres offers an operator called I like. It is Postgres specific. I usually don't teach a lot of Postgres specific syntax, but Postgres provides I like. And I like works great. As you can see right here, this person has a capital N and a lowercase o. And I'm going to hit go. And now we got all the NOs. So we got Noemi and a Bruno and a Breton. These are all different names. They all have uh, the Anolan over here. If we scroll through this, you'll see different versions of the NO in different places. So what this is saying is I want to match NO anywhere inside the name. And I don't care to be case sensitive. That's what I like does. If I were to take the I off, so this returned 406 rows, as you can see down here. If I hit the Run button, now it returns 161 rows. 
<coughs> Why? Because it's only matching on lowercase no, because it's case sensitive. Now, as I stated, I like is Postgres specific. If you have to work with something that's not Postgres, what can you do? There is what they call an ANSI standard method of achieving the same thing. They have a function called lower. And if I go lower name, it takes the contents in here and makes it all lowercase. Now, if I go back to running it, I'm back to 406 rows. This is the exact equivalent of doing using I like. On Postgres, I like is marginally faster, just so you know. Why? Because it's been written for Postgres, it's optimized for Postgres. Whereas upper and lower are not. They're generally they're created specifically for cross-platform compatibility. They're both valid, they'll both work. The actual gains from one or the other are so negligible that you can use whichever technique you want. That, that covers the case sensitivity side of this deal. I'm going to go back to using I like for now. Now, when you do pattern matching, you have to use what they call wildcard characters. And SQL provides two wildcard characters. Wildcard character number one is the percent sign. What does the percent sign mean? It means match any character zero or more times. In other words, this will find anything that starts an N or has N anywhere in it. Ditto for this. This will mean once you find the NO, I don't care if it's the last thing or if there's anything after it. So that's what percent sign means. The other one we have is underscore. Underscore says match one character and only one character and only match it and it must be there. There must be something there. So if you go underscore NO, it'll find anything NO, but there has to be something in front of NO. If I did this, it'll still work because actually I should be able to exclude 18. Then I'm pointing at it here with my finger like you can see it on the screen, but you can see 18 disappeared. Sometimes I wish I could get the, my finger to point up at the screen easier. You see 18 here? I said match anything, but there must be something in front of the NO because all the no me and the no way and the Nolans have nothing in front of the NO. It excludes all of them. Match any character zero or more times. Underscore means match any character once and it must be there. So those are the two pattern matching tools, patterns that you have. Um, you can put these wildcard characters anywhere you want and you can play with it until you've achieved your goal. So for example, if I'm trying to find Anybody who has, for example, an E, an underscore, and an N, anywhere in their name, I can run this. So now we got E space N, E, well, N, N, because there's that's replacing that one, E, U, N. So this is letting you match, you know, if you don't exactly know the spelling. It's great if you're, um, somebody tells you you need to find a record and they said the guy's name is Don. And what'd they say? Don? Dan? What did they say? So you could go D underscore N, it'll find all the Dons and the Dans. It's a, uh, percentages match anything? zero or more times. Underscore is match one, match anything once, and it must be there. So it's a required placeholder. I don't care what's there, but there must be something there. And it just go. I did this example just to show you that you can mix match your your, ma your pattern matching any way you want.
Okay. Now, so far I've been searching for anywhere inside the string. If you decide to exclude, say, the first bit, that'll give me anything who starts with n, just so you know. So like n percent sign will give me anybody whose name starts with n. If I flip it to the other side, it'll give me give me everybody whose name ends in n. If I can do that, I said give me everybody whose name starts in n, then their last name ends in n. So n n at each end of their name. I don't even know if there's any like that in the database. Apparently there is. Um, you can mess with this a little bit more if you want to. For example, let's just say you want to make sure that there's another that's it's com coming off the separated names like this. You could put a space between two percent signs. So it'll say, give me anything that starts with n, has a space inside of it in the middle somewhere, and then there's an n at the end. Or you could get fancy and say, give me all the hyphenated names so I can find all the French people that have funny hyphenated names. Actually, now there's a bunch of English people with hyphenated names too, so give me anybody who's got hyphenated names. That's one way of doing it. And believe it or not, that's pretty much all there is to pattern matching inside Postgres. There are two other tools they provide to you um, because they're not universally supported. I don't cover it in the class. Um, they are mentioned on the slides if you're looking for them. There's Instead of like, there's also one called similar to which provides more robust pattern matching. Uh, for example, similar to can let you go D, and then you can say the middle letter must be A or O, and then the next letter is N. You can actually specify the rules of what that empty character would be. How many times have I used that function in my career? Anybody want to take a guess? Absolutely zero, except when I did it in front of students. I'm talking actually like, you know, really working. This is a different kind of work. But I've never used similar to, heck, until three years ago I didn't even know similar to existed because I never needed to look it up. The alternative past that is something called regular expressions, regex. Regex is something you guys will learn later through this course, like this program, not this course. Later in this program you'll be introduced to regular expressions. Uh, and regular expressions are the shit. Um, the problem is that no two database server implements them quite the same way. So there's no point in me showing you how to use them because A, the, I have a reference book on my desk at work and it's about that thick for regular expressions. It's almost a language to itself. And not all database servers behave the same way when it comes to regular expressions. They all do it a little differently, therefore I'd rather teach the generics, which is portable. Uh, theoretically, yeah, we could do that. We could go uh, first name ending in N, you mean? Actually, no, hold on, not this one, like that. So anything N space percent. So it'll say anything until you hit and there it is, all the first names that end in N. That's how you do it. The only way to really experiment with this is just play with it until you get it right. If I take the space out, it'll just find the name that has that's N. If you don't put in wildcard characters, you might as well use an equal sign. Okay? N. Hey, there's a student in this class whose name is A. A. No, just A. Or is it this group or the other group? One of my two groups has a student whose name is, I think the last name is A. Cool. Um, definitely makes spelling their name easy. A. Not making fun of you if you're here, by the way. Um, just going to show, you know, there's, there are names. Um, okay, so that's pattern matching. I'm going to move on from pattern matching to talk about the worst topic 
dates and timestamps. Dates are easy, and I'm sure your dates suck. So timestamps are time. Dates are easy. Time is easy. Timestamps suck. He keeps flapping. What do you want me to do? He's going to get burned, right, Moonbeam? Now, shit, that wasn't called for, but anyways. <laughs> um, dates are easy to work with because dates are dates. They don't involve anything but the actual whole day. Time is easy because it involves a specific time. It's not as easy as dates, but it involves a specific time. On the other hand, when you deal with timestamps, they're a real pain in the ass. They really are. Now I'm going to throw in a new keyword here that you haven't seen yet. That's even before I start working with the dates. There's a keyword called limit. I'm going to use limit just to make this go a little faster, the, my queries. Limit limits how many rows get returned. So I'm going to return the first 100 rows. Yes, Moonbeam. No, the keywords are case insensitive. <laughs> Do you love the dynamic? Limit 100. That means I'm only going to retrieve the first 100 rows. Why? Because when I run this, it's going to run boop fast. If I take off limit 100, this will take four seconds. So I just want this to be a little quicker on the response so I can demonstrate what I'm talking about. And by the way, limit always goes right at the end. It's the very last thing. Now, if I, you look down here, and I can't make this any bigger, but if you guys are running this on your own instance of Postgres, you can see it a little clearer. Although well, this screen's pretty good. Um, you'll see it's year, month, day, space, hours, minutes, second, and it uses the 24-hour clock. So everybody else from anywhere else in the world plus Quebec, you got no problems. People from Ontario and west of Ontario, you're all screwed. Get used to 23, the 24-hour clock. Oh, yeah, Americans. America. See, it's great. I got Moonbeam and an American sitting side by side. It's great. Now, when you deal with the date, you have to think about the whole date. And the database servers make small assumptions about what you type in. If I go where order date is equal to, and let's say I want this one right up here. So the October 26, 2015. And you don't want the space in there, just so you know. Now dates look like strings. They behave like strings, sort of. You can't do pattern matching on it, just so you know. It assumes it's greater than, less than, equal to, not equal to, that's fine. You just can't pattern match on it. Now I'm going to run this. And I should get a big fat no rows returned. Why? It's because if you're working with a timestamp, it assumes this. It assumes that timestamp. So if you don't provide the entire timestamp, it assumes zero. Down to the microsecond. Like, theoretically, you could have a record like that, and it would not catch it. Well, depending on how you set up the database. There are, you know, you can set the precision if you want to. But you have to assume the worst case scenario. So it assumes that date, which of course there's no records in this database with that timestamp. The odds of actually ever having a record with that timestamp being automatically generated by a server is almost non-existent. And I can't say it can't happen, but the odds, you probably have a better chance of winning the American Powerball than you do of having a database server hit absolute perfect zero, unless you've set it to absolute perfect zero. Which then leads me to the problem. Well, I want all the transactions from the 26th of October. How do I find it? Well then, since it assumes dead midnight, well, I can say, well, give me everything greater than or equal to the 26th. And then you can do, you have two choices for the second half. You can do that, which is kind of gross. 
but it works theoretically as you can see there's all my my records 77 of them you can be a little bit lazier less than the 27th since it starts at dead midnight anyways it'll give you everything that could have happened before that moment which should give me the same number of rows um, alternatively you can also use between those two dates, uh, now you don't want this over here. What am I doing? Holy crap, Dan. Sorry, having uh, some uh, brain syntax issues. There we go. Same goal. It does the same thing. And it's like when I was explaining the concepts of goal posts when you talk about using between. In the labs, those who have already done the labs with me have already heard the little talk about goal posts when you use between. A goal post is an unofficial term. There's no real word. It's just my prof called it goal post when he taught it to me, so that's what I use when I teach to you guys. When you use between, the goal posts are the outside edges. That's the outside edge of the range. And between is inclusive. That means it always includes the goal posts with it. So imagine if you're playing football and they have a kickoff and the ball hits the goal post, that still counts. And if you don't want it to include the goalpost, you have to tell it grab everything inside the goalpost. So you go one on each side of the goalpost, which is what we're exploiting here. Since this assumes dead midnight, and this one assumes dead midnight also, which is impossible in either case, it'll coerce in just a hair. All right, so that is one of the bits and pieces you can use for dealing with dates and timestamps. There is... Um, three other ways of doing this and they improve and get worse uh, depending on how much uh, effort you want to put into it now so far I've heard about a 50 50 split on people understanding the concept of casting those of you that took casting in Java does that ring a bell okay the other group has had casting then the other group has a 100% hit rate on casting. Casting means you're converting one data type into another. Yeah. It's also known as coercing. You can coerce the data type from one type to another. It's just casting is more uh, politically correct than coercing. One sounds like you're forcing it and one says sounds like it's agreeing to it. It's all a matter of words. Now, when you cast it, there's Postgres provides, of course, two ways of casting. Option number one, it's got this double colon thing. And what that's going to do is it's going to convert the timestamp into a date. And that way you can do a precise match. And we still have our 77 rows, just to show you that it's doing the exact same thing. So what I just did is I took the timestamp and I told it, don't be a timestamp. Be a date. Ignore the fact that you're more precise. And away you go. Now, th once again, this is Postgres specific syntax. As always, Postgres aims to give you the most flexible way of doing things. And of course, this is slightly faster because it's, you know, specific to Postgres. However, what you also have the option of doing is there's a function called cast. And this is the ANSI standard method, which means this should theoretically, and I'm putting in big air quotes, theoretically work on Oracle. It should work on MySQL. It should work on Microsoft SQL Server. And then I'm going to try to run it. And look at this. <coughs> So returns, I'm just telling it, just show me the first 100. So instead of waiting four seconds every time I hit the run button, I'm just going to pull back the first 100. But I'm actually only returning 77 rows because there's only 77 rows that match. Because I'm only running one command at a time. <coughs> okay. So, believe it or not, that's how you deal with dates and timestamps. There's nothing more to it than that.
Now, what I'm going to talk about next is, um, actually, no, there's one more thing to talk about dates. I just remembered the joy of not using a slideshow to teleprompt me of what comes next. Sometimes you want to get all the records that only happen during part of the date. So you want everything to happen in October. Now, there's a Nancy standard way of doing it. And for once, Postgres, either I don't remember what the syntax is properly, or Postgres is being anal, anal retentive about it. Um, but there is a non ANSI standard way, which Postgres provides, which is as follows. Now I'm just double checking my, uh, my syntax before I start typing, make sure I'm using the right keyword. Yeah, that's the one I want. Uh, actually, I'm going to go month. Uh, is that right? Yeah. There's something called date part. Date part's really cool. Uh, because it allows you to actually rip out specific parts of the date. So I can, I'm telling it, okay, now give me anything that happened in October. And if you look down here, you'll see all these different years and these different months and the different days. And they're all broken down. It gives you some flexibility. I can do that and you can see right here I'm extracting just that chunk. So that's another piece of functionality you have. The ANSI standard is called extract and uh, Postgres is not cooperating with it lately and I don't know why but that's okay. It used to work. Maybe the ANSI standard changed and Postgres decided not to bother fix it because they provide you the equivalent anyways. Um, date part lets you target specific pieces of information. So in theory, now I could actually take this, do a count of these values, and give you the numbers month by month, or the year by year. So I could look at all the sales for the month of October, broken down by years. That's kind of nifty. Now I'm going to talk about numbers, and this one's really, really quick. Actual fact, there's already one here. I heard someone say, oh. Okay. Tell me when you're ready. Thank you. All right. Actually, I'm going to leave it as is anyways because I'm, I was coming back to it. I was going to reuse it anyways. When I'm talking about numbers, I'll often see on the labs that people sit there and they put their numbers inside of quote marks. It'll work. Not everywhere. But the problem that we have with quote, well, the problem that database servers have with you quoting your numbers, and if you know for a fact it's a number. So, for example, if you know the field's an integer, which, you know, if you do a date part and you extract the date part, it's coming out as an integer because you don't have, you know, 10.2 months. It's not month 10.2, it's month 10. When you do the quote marks, the database server takes a look at that and goes, oh, you're comparing the string to a number. I'm going to take your string, convert it to a number, and then I'll do the comparison. Not a lot of overhead per se, especially when you're running on your local machine by yourself. You have nothing else impacting your performance. And even on a server that might get 1,000 transactions an hour, it, that's negligible. Scale that up a little bit till you hit a server that gets thousands of transactions a second. The casting adds maybe a microsecond, half a millisecond to the operating time because it's got to take the time to take the step to convert it from an integer to a string, I mean a string to an integer, or a string to a float as applicable. That actually string to float is actually more expensive than string to integer, just so you know, like the more precise your number is, the more work the server has to do to achieve it. Once it's converted that to 
a number, it runs a query. And if it adds, I'll use a millisecond because it's an easier piece of math. So if you're doing 1,000 transactions a second, and each transaction uses one millisecond, one millisecond times 1,000 is one second. So now that 1,000 transactions are taking two seconds instead of one second. So the next one is delayed by, two, by a second, which adds another second. And then that batch is delayed by a second. So suddenly, instead of running 3,000 queries in three seconds, you're going to run 3,000 queries in six seconds. And this number keeps compounding as it goes. Try to do your type matching precise. So if you know you're working with numbers, put in as a number. Don't put quotes. And by the way, I've had people try to do this. For a date. That's exactly what it's going to do. So suddenly you got 2015. Oh, now it's 2005. Now take 26 years off 2005. Whatever it is. What is it there, Chad? <laughs> don't start feeling one ever to answer. But I just don't feel like doing the math. <laughs> nice. But you don't want to do that because it actually does a mathematical operator instead. So it'll take year minus month minus day. And then it gets kind of weird after if you have a space in hours because then it's going to blow up and says no. Uh, yeah. The what? It's called, it's call, it's basically it has to either cast or coerce the data type. So if you put a number between quote marks, the database server needs to convert it to a number before it can work with it. Therefore, it has to do one extra step. And that extra step takes time. And then, you know, it's like when you go to go out the door and somebody's blocking the door a bit and you have to take one step to the side to get through the door, it takes that, you know, fraction of a second longer to get the job done because somebody's being an ass and blocking the door. And you have to step around them. Same thing, because you're providing a string instead of an actual number, the parser has to convert that string to a number, and then it can do the job. That means that you gave it one extra step to do. Okay. Now. So that's how you query dates. That's how you query uh, numbers. That's how you do pattern matching. There's, I need to talk about a few other items. And the next one I'm going to talk about is brackets. How brackets affect the results of your query. So if I go, you have to use quotes on all dates. All dates and all times have quotes. They look like a string, but they're not a string. They're kind of a string. But basically, it's a string that get that the database server knows automatically how to convert to a date. So it doesn't have to think about it. It just knows what it has to do. All right. So I'm going to run select star from order lines because it's good to know what's in there. And of course, this is a huge one. So I'm going to put my limit statement on in just a second. That's 114,000 and change rows. I'm going to put my limit 100 again, just for argument's sake. Now I'm going to talk about bracketing. For those of you that remember high school math, how do you resolve brackets? Yes, and you do the inside first. And if you have multiple sets of brackets, and then you work your way out from each of those. If you, because this is part of what they call uh, operate, uh, precedence of operators. And most database servers all follow the same rules, but there's the odd one that doesn't follow the rules. And normally the rules are as follows, not, and, or. So if you're negating something, it gets run first. Then if you're doing an and, in other words, you're connecting two different criteria, it'll do that first, and then it'll do the or. So for example, 
If I run this, I'm looking for only one thing. Give me all the products that have a quantity of four. I return the first hundred rows because, you know, I'm returning the first hundred rows. Now I'm going to run this and I'm going to get zero rows back. And this is where I'm going to highlight a piece of logical fallacy. Why does this not work? I wish I had cookies because I give a cookie to the first one that gets it. Why am I getting nothing? It's impossible for a quantity to be four and five at the same time. It's like me saying, hey, you'd use or. Ta-da. You get a cookie. You get a virtual cookie. Quantity is four or five. A lot of people will write it and, and then they get nothing, and they wonder why. Why? Because your brain says, well, you know, I want the ones where the quantity is four and or five, which it can't be and. Now, this is fine. So far, I haven't needed a bracket. No. But there's actually XOR and X and. I don't remember what they do. But they're, they're there. No, no, they're, um, it's, um, it's a bitwise operation. And it's a logic thing. And I just don't remember what the heck exactly how they work. I haven't used those in so long that I think the last time I used XOR was like grade 11 math. But the guys who develop in Windows, like the Windows developers, C++ developers at work use it all the time. You don't use XOR in database very often. Now, So I'm going to run this, and you'll notice a few uh, things that are going to disappear. Specifically, this row is going to go away, and I'll ex explain to you why. Quantity 4, oh, look at this, there's some 217s, even though I'm telling it. Well, I want the extended price to be less than 100. But hey, the 5 is less than 100, but the 4s, there's a bunch of more than 100 for the 4s. Why? Because it's doing the AND first, and then the or. So it's resolving this. So what it's doing is it's virtually putting these brackets in place over or. And that's actually how you solve it. So I want everything that's four or five and the, pr the extended price is less than 100 bucks. And now it works. I'm going to throw one more set of brackets on here. So now what's going to happen is it'll give me anything that's 4 or 5 that is less than 100 or anything that's got more than 250 bucks as the extend line total. And I go, boom. There we go. So we got a 5. We also got a 5. And as you can see, now it's all kind of fuckered up. Why? Because it's actually ca this one's actually causing all of this to break up here. But I also got some 3s mixed in here. And some of that. I can do this, which will never work. So how do you resolve this? You just keep playing with it until you get it right. Okay. It's going to resolve this, then resolve this one. Then it takes all of these and then it says, oh, by the way, I want anything that's more than 250. So if I run it without highlighting anything again, you'll notice the 4s and the 5s are either less than 100 or more than 250, but nothing in between. But by the same token, we're going to get some 3s that are more than 250. Uh, I think there's actually nothing other than it. There's no 
Well, there might be more if I took off my limit. But you can see how it's kind of messing with it, right? So if you didn't want any of these, you'd have to go down here and go Uh, come again? Uh, yeah, probably you could mix match until you got what you wanted out of it. Uh, in theory, I could go... Um, I can't actually even exclude the 250s out of this here. I'd actually have to include this down here. No, because then I wouldn't get the threes. I wanted the threes because I want right. But what happens if I don't want the four and fives that are more than two hundred fifty that are more than two hundred and fifty? Then I'd have to actually keep adding to the or here and saying where the quantity is not this and the quantity is not that. And then it would give you the rest. So it's just complex Boolean logic where you just keep breaking it down to its smallest components and then you just figure out where the mistakes are as you go. All right. Actually, I'm right on time. I get, I get to cover everything I want to cover today. I wasn't sure if I was going to. Next topic is this is something the guys on Monday didn't get, just so you know, uh, because they get their lecture before their labs, which this is you're going to need for lab eight at least part of this for lab eight. I'm going to talk about aggregate functions. <laughs> I just made her day. Aggregate functions. Aggregate functions are math operators. The Postgres has tons and tons of them. However, there are some that are universally used. And they are as follows. Min, which gives you the minimum value. Max, which gives you the Maximum value, also known as the biggest value. Count, which counts the number of rows returned. Sum, it adds up the values in a given column. AVG, which stands for average, gives you the average value inside that, those columns. Um, there's a few others. Min, uh, mean is there. and But those are the big ones people would use. So you've got min, max. Average, count, and sum. Those are the five biggies that most people use. Uh, Postgres has about 15 aggregate functions or more. I don't remember off the top of my head. But they, they're not the same on all the things. Like they actually allow for linear distribution if you want. They actually got all the stats ones that you'd expect in most statistics systems. It'll actually do stats for you. Um, now, with the aggregate functions, there's a few bits and pieces that come into effect. And one of the reasons I moved this course to Postgres years ago is because Postgres is a little bit militant about how you use aggregates. MySQL is really loosey-goosey, and it lets you do things that you shouldn't be able to do, ever. And it just actually allows you to actually generate completely invalid data. And it says, oh, that's what you wanted. That's good enough. Here, there you go. As usual, it'll do exactly what you told it to do, but it makes assumptions. Postgres doesn't let you, doesn't want to make the assumptions, so it makes you actually be explicit. Now, aggregate functions are used in the select portion. I'm just going to do that. Uh, the heck is that again? I want to know what that column's called. Oh, shoot. Four seconds later. Okay, fine. Six seconds later. Extended price. Duh. Can you tell I've been grading people's uh, assignments? <laughs> I've seen line totals show up all over the place. Okay, so I'm going to extract order ID quantity and extended price from the database. And so I got my three sets of numbers. These are all useful pieces of information, but let's say you want to run a report and you want to know 
for example, what the total quantity and the total extent of price was for an order. So how many items were in that order, regardless of what the items are, and what is the total that the person's spending on it? You could use sum. And I'm going to run that. Okay, here's my first error message. And that was intentional, by the way. Do you see right here where it says column X, or whatever it is, must be in group by clause or use an aggregate function? When you use an aggregate function, you must, and you supply a display col column, in other words, a column that's going to not being added up, it has to be included in the group by clause. If it's not there, the query will not work. For example, how many of you here have ever done a survey? Not done survey as in fill it out, as in run a survey to collect information. One, two, three, four, five, six, okay. Not that there's people that were willing to raise their hands, more people were less embarrassed about the fact that they ran surveys. And you did. There you go. Welcome to the club. But do you remember tabulating the results of the, qu the survey, how much that sucked? Right? You basically look at the survey and you go, Question one, person, this person said one. Question two, the person said three. Question four, person said five. And then you take the next survey and then you keep adding up tallying, right? But what the thing is, is you're saying question one, then you count the total. Question one had 25 responses. Question two had 23 responses. And you count up the different, you're making bins, but you're still keeping track of these bins. That's the display column. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw on what's called a group by clause group by. And in this case, any column that's not part of the aggregate has to be in the group by. And the more things you put in the group by, the more precise, the more often the numbers get broken down. So if I run it like this, I went from 114,000 rows down to 43,000 rows. Why? Because I'm getting a total per order ID. And each of these is how many, how much quantity and what the total sale price was. So remember when at the start of the term when I was talking about um, derived columns? And for example, the order total would be, the subtotal would be a derived column. Why? Because you can add it up. Guess what I just did? I just created a derived column. And the cool thing is, is I can add as many aggregates as I want. And I'm in a second, I'm going to actually put labels on these so they make more sense to you. I'm going to run count. Now this is showing that this order had three rows for a total of 12 items in it for $513. This order had one item in it for one thing and it sold for 122 bucks and change. I'm doing math. It's magic. Now, this is handy and all as far as things go. But sometimes you want a slightly better label on them because count sum and sum means nothing down here. And especially once you start dealing with this data in an application. So you got a web app and you're running stats out of a, a store. For example, you know, got a shopping cart that you installed for your website and you want to run some reports. And you've written a nice web page where, you know, your office administrator can go and get their, their numbers for the month so they can give it to the bean counter. And, you know, you want it to actually output. The problem is when you have columns that are named the same thing and it hits a programming language, depending on how the programming language deals with something called an array, one of two things is going to happen. A, it's going to blow up. Why? Because arrays are not supposed to have two array elements of the same name. Or option B, and if it's a scripting language like Python or PHP, it won't blow it up. It's just going to go, oh, we got an order ID, we got a count, we've got a sum, it's 12. Oh, look, I got another sum. Well, I guess that's not the one they wanted. Sum must be 513, not 12. So you end up with three columns being returned. Because two are called the same, it keeps the last one it sees. So you want to rename your columns. And in databases, you rename stuff using something called an alias. Now, in the real world, what is an alias? Not talk about database or computer program language. What's an alias? 
It's a fake name. Also known as John Doe is wanted for stealing chickens. Also known as Frank. Has been known to kick the chickens occasionally. Also known as Link. But using an example, right? Aliases, because they keep renaming things as you go. You can do that inside the database. You can rename your, your columns. You can also rename your tables. And I'm going to show you the example now of renaming a column. Because then when I go to show you guys the start of the join stuff, I'll show you why you want to rename your tables. I'm going to run it again. And now it's been run, and now I see I've got nice names for each of my columns. Nice names. Now, going way back, as in when I was in college, it's been a few years, one of the courses we took, we typed the commands in on the computer, but we couldn't actually see the output because it came out on a line printer. So you type in a report, you'd set up the report to run, wasn't using SQL, it's a different language, but you know the concepts were very similar. You'd set up your report to run, but you could not see it on your screen. You'd execute the report, it would go directly to the line printer. And I don't know if anybody here has ever seen a line printer or heard a line printer. They're about that wide. They have a lot of fan fold paper, continuous feed paper, and it goes rah, 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 rah. And ours could print a page every second and a half. So it sounded like a minigun going off. Your report came out. Congratulations, somebody forgot the group. He just wasted 26 pages when it was supposed to be half a page. Problem is, back then, is you needed to output your columns nicely. And you can actually have the option of doing things like this. Still in this day, and I don't know why they didn't take this away, but it's still there. Now notice I'm using double quotes because Postgres wants to treat this name as an object for whatever reason. And Postgres, you use double quotes to identify objects. In MySQL, you could use single quotes if you want. Now if I run this, you'll see right here where I'm moving my mouse, order number is nice. Totally useless in a programming language. But if you need to output directly to a printer or you're maybe generating a CSV file that you can open up in Excel, you can actually have nice column names if you so choose. It's a choice. I wouldn't recommend it, but, you know, there once was a time where we actually had to do it that way. And I know during my SQL courses, when I learned, my SQL, um, learned SQL in college, if we didn't put these nice names at the top of our queries, my, my prof would take points off. Because... Make it look nice. That was the rule. You know, it's like using the right font at the right point with the right line spacing in certain other courses. The, the ones that snort know which course I'm talking about. You know, that's how you end up being successful. <laughs> but, you know, that's how you're successful in that course is you follow the rules. Now, I've renamed my columns. I've created my aggregates. Now, there's a few other things we can have with this. And by the time I'm touching, te done teaching this SQL, not just today, well, actually, I could probably almost do it today. I'll give you guys the, the list of the order of how the different commands in the SQL language get put together so you don't get it out of sync. And I'll actually post it on Blackboard so you guys actually have it. There's one more piece when you talk about aggregates. Two more things, actually, I should say about aggregates. Rule number one which this is a rule, this isn't a thing, this is a rule. This is very important, you cannot aggregate an aggregate. Now I just caused at least three brains to melt when I said that. In other words, let's just say you want to have the average sum. So I want to know what the average sum is per order. You can't do that, why? Because the aggregate is run at the end of the query. In other words, it collects all the rows then it does all the math. Then it's done. 
It's not going to say, oh, I'm going to do math on something that doesn't exist yet. You can't do that. So you can't aggregate an aggregate. If you try, you'll get an error. And it's going to look like this. Aggregate functions cannot be nested. Congratulations. There are a few ways of solving this. Some are better than others. Um, next week I'll be showing you the, the proper way of resolving it because there won't be enough time today to cover to that detail. Uh, but there is a way of doing it. If you need to aggregate an aggregate, you just don't do it like this. Um, the other piece of information about aggregates is you can filter on your aggregates. So far I've shown you guys about the where clause, right? You've seen where. where something is equal to something or something is greater than something because you can filter. What that does is it'll reduce the number of columns being counted by um, the aggregate function. So I can go where order underscore ID less than 25,000. So I just want to go do this math on the first 25,000 rows in the database. And that didn't work. Oh, I know why. My order IDs start high. They start above 25,000. When I rebuilt this database multiple times for you guys, the order IDs are higher than that. So 50,000. So I'm getting 22,000 rows back. Where I, So, you know, that's fairly reasonable. You can see it's all over 25,000. And it goes all the way up to 50,000. I could go less than, say, 30,000. So I just want to pull back the first, you know, sets of orders. That's the where clause. However, we have something called having. Having happens after the grouping. And I can say, okay, now, I'm going to run this, and I got it totally wrong because I'm a tool. No, because I was working with MySQL, and that's what MySQL does. Postgres difference. Okay, there we go. Now, I've reduced this somewhat again. Now, here's what the logic of what's happening. I'm going to select some, rec some information from order lines where the order ID is less than 30,000. So far, that's actually was pretty normal stuff. You're telling it, okay, group it by order ID. Okay, so, so far, so good. This is something we've been able to do, no problem. But we end up with quantities that are smaller. There's fours and threes in here. But let's say I want to say, well, I just want to know all the orders that have at least five things in it. So at least a quantity of five total within the order was ordered. That's called having. So what it does is it runs all of this first and then it looks at the results of your query and applies a secondary filter on it. This is where having comes in. Having will reduce the results coming back based on the results of the aggregate. So, once again, the query retrieves the records out of the database. Bang. It does some math on it. It sums stuff up, it adds up, it finds some averages. Bang. Then you're saying, well, okay, now you've done all that math for me. Just give me a smaller set. I don't want all the records back. I want some of the records back and based on this criteria. And that's what having does. Having filters on the results of the aggregate, whereas where filters before the aggregate. So where, aggregate, having. And what's the aggregate? It's the group by. So where, group by, having, and it operates it in that order. So it filters out the rows first, does the math, and then lets you filter out. It's just like when you do a survey. You often, with a survey, you'll get rid of the bottom percentage and the top percentage because, you know, often the outside edges are not necessarily, va they're valid, but they're not necessarily valid because, you know, you'll get the odd douchebag that puts in ones for everything. 
You got the other ones that put in fives for everything, even though it's the same survey. Their surveys are valid, as in they submitted a survey, but they're not really valid because they didn't actually take any time to actually think about what they were answering. They just gave everything ones. Or they gave everything fives. Really, you want thoughtful answers, so you could actually use the having to exclude the ones that have the outlying areas. Or in this case, I want to know the ones that have at least quantities of five. I could turn this to quantities of more than ten. Or I could go after the high ticket orders where the quantity is less than five and like this. So anything where they sold less than five but the order total was still more than 500 bucks. And I can return that. And now you can see I got, you know, totals of four where the, the price is more than five. I mean, the grand extended for the order total is more than 500. Yes? What? I think the price is like pay attention as much as I can to the average of whatever they said. What we're summing it up, what is this our ID? And why do I have to group by order ID function or anything else? Okay, let's. Aggregate functions are functions that allow you to uh, do math operations on rows. Okay. Uh, rows. On rows. However, some of them apply to the row, some apply to the columns inside the row. For example, counting counts the entire row. Right? If you count something, it counts how many times it happens. If you sum, it's just like Excel where you add up a column. That's a sum. Average is the same thing. You can do the average of a column, of the returned rows. So that's what an aggregate is. Now, if you're asking what the group by is, is because there's a column here that's not being operated on. There's an, I'm not summing, I'm not averaging, I'm not counting, I'm not doing anything with it. That means that I want to summarize by that column. It's like creating bins. So you're going to create bins based on order ID. And you have to create the bin by putting it in the group by bin, the clause. Now you sum the qual columns, so it's going to add up all the values in quantity, or in this case it'll add up all the values inside of sum. I mean inside of extended price. So it'll take all the extended prices, add them up by order. So the order ID is each order, so it'll add up all the extended prices inside that order. And it'll give you a number for that. It'll add up all the quantities inside that order. That's if you don't have a group by. Like I'm running it right now and I'm saying, okay, I'll take, I'll run this first half here. It's like with the way I see it, there's like, for every row, there's like, let's say, one quantity column. There's one quantity column, but that quantity could be repeated multiple times for that order because you have three things in your order. For example, you go to Loblaws and you buy three boxes of cereal. Well, no, it's actually, if you look inside of order lines, so if I do the, the raw version of order lines, here's our quantity, here's our price, here's our extended price. And if I could actually have these coming out together, you'd see that All right, so order 100, uh, still not. Yeah, okay, that's right, right here. There, that's one order. You can see the quantity is repeated four times. Well, no, but I just chose to, to group it on that. Okay. So I'm going to create a bin based on order ID, and I'm going to add up the quantity which is going to be summed up by this, and I'll take the extended price, which is summed up by that. And I, since I counted how many rows are returned, it'll return four. Which, you know, depending on which I'm looking at. So this one had three rows, a total of 10 things in the order, and all the extended prices added together gives me 400. Okay, 
And as I was saying, there's also the having clause at the end, which means based on all this before it, so it'll run this, which gives me totals. I can now filter on the totals down here. So let's say I don't want quantities less than five, or I want quantities less than five where the extent. So if I can go, give me all the orders, but only where there's less than five things in the shopping cart. And how much did they spend on those five things? So you can see right here, one for 18 bucks, three for $47 total. And then I can actually turn it around and say, go further than that, say, give me everything that's less than five quantity, but they still spent more than 500 bucks on it. And that's people that are buying expensive things. The only way to learn this is to experiment with it. So play with it on your own, and it'll make more sense. Uh, yeah, lab eight is some of this. Okay. Now, there's the order of the, yep, yeah, before I continue. For a small data set, the program language will be fa the same. Roughly. On the other hand, if you look talking about large data sets, the server is always going to be faster. They're design database servers are designed to do this. Whereas if you're writing code, you're writing the code as well as you understand it. These guys have spent 40 years, not just Postgres, but 40 years improving database theory on how to write this properly to make it happen faster. And what is faster to transmit? 10,000 rows or 17 rows? The 17 rows because there's a lot less data being moved. You're better off asking the server to do the heavy lifting for you. Unless it's really, really complex math, get the server to do it for you. It's simpler. It's more effective. Okay? So now I'm just going to bring in the last little bit of the, or, the, the, order of op, the, the order of the commands inside the SQL statement before I get to the last topic of the day. Okay, that's the order that you write an SQL statement in without all the other words. In other words, these are all the pieces you can use in an SQL statement in the order you'd use them in. There's actually technically one more in between here, which is what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, Joya joins. But this is the order that you put it in. So if you're not sure why it's complaining about your having clause being in the wrong place, this is the order of all the bits and pieces of the SQL language, of at least the select statement. It's well worth noting, and I'll actually leave that one up so people have a chance to write it down. Because that's actually an important one. <laughs> Just putting it out there. That's actually a common issue people have, is they forget what order the things get to it done in, and that's the order you do it in. Why is there a tab on the, on the Because it's part of the from. I moved the join over because it's technically part of from, but the join is between the from and the where. But it's because you don't always use the join, but you could use all of this without needing a join. But you can also choose, you know, and it actually runs as follows. It'll do this in that order, and then you can do having, and then you can do order by. So technically you can do select from, and you can do select from with a join, but you can also do a select from with the where, but without the join, that's why I have a tab. But you go select from where, you can do select from where, group by, you can do select from where having. You can also do select from and order by. Order by is kind of magical, it's at the end on its own. But it's the order that you'd put it in. These are the sets of commands grouped together in the order you'd use them in. It's good to know. It, say, it might save you a couple of minutes of head pounding. And then it leads me to joins. And I'm just going to talk about joins shortly today, just so that you have the basic concepts. Because I'll be talking about joins in length next week. At length, I should say, not in length, at length next week. Joins, I'll be completely honest, suck. Why? It's the hardest concept to learn when you're dealing with SQL. 
A lot of people have a hard time understanding joints. The only way you get good at joints is to do lots of joints. And how do you practice doing joints? You write new statements and you experiment with it. You just try it until you get it right. Some people never get it. I don't know why, but some people never do. But I can guarantee you definitely want to know how to do joints by the end of this term. Hint, hint, hint. Um, because it'd be really practical if you knew how to use joints. <laughs> by the same token, there are tutorials posted on Blackboard under course documents that will help you understand some of this term terminology. I'd strongly recommend you go look at those tutorials. They're actually really decent. Yeah, they're listed under course documents. There's two tutorials in there. I definitely recommend going through them. Uh, the PostgresTutorial.com, I think it's called, is it's pretty spiffy. Um, it's very terse. As in, they don't spend a lot of time explaining concepts, but they're really in plain English. So, you know, if you, eh? There's nothing in French. It's all English. It's an American site. They don't have to worry about bilingualism. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about joins. And I'm actually I'm going to pull up a slide for a minute, <coughs> even though I said I wasn't. Uh, this one. I think. Adios. Ah, hot damn, I found it. Okay, joins. Joins are used to retrieve data from multiple tables at once. So that's the simple plain English. In other words, you got data in two tables. And remember when I made you do your assignments where I made you draw lines between tables and it made foreign keys? So you could connect the tables using common data points. That's what you use joins for. It's to retrieve data from separate bins that are connected to each other. There's three common types and one not so common. And apparently now they've created a couple new ones that aren't even included on the slide. <coughs> apparently when Postgres 9.6 came out, they, they brought in some new kind of join, which I'd never heard about before. Uh, and I still don't really understand what it does because I haven't played with it. I haven't had a chance to actually experiment with it. But the three common types of joins are the inner join, the left join, and the right join. Okay. <laughs> Those that have done a little bit of database and learned a bit of SQL before knows joins suck. But <laughs> it just sucks until you understand how it works. Now, inner, left, and right. The inner join is match rows from both tables, and the, they have to match in both tables. That's an inner join. The left and the right join allows you to match all the rows from one table plus anything that might match in the other. I show, I'm going to demonstrate left and right joins next week. Then there's the full join. This is the only time I'm ever going to talk about a full join. It's also known as a cross join. It's also known as a Cartesian join. Just so you know, those are the three ways of calling that exact same thing. What are these kinds of joins? Okay. Cartesian join, cross join, full join. Deck of cards. How many face values are there in a deck of card? 13. How many suits are there? Four. Cartesian join takes the 13 suits, I mean the 13 face values times the four suits, and gives you 52 values. So you go from 13 and 4 to 52. How does it work? Hearts, so Ace of hearts, two of hearts, three of hearts, four of hearts. One of, one of clubs, two of clubs, three of clubs, four of clubs. Then we're going to talk about the other ones. But that's where it ends. You know, I'm stopping at clubs. But essentially, you end up adding up all of them together. So you take the combinations of each of the sets of information, and you basically multiply so you have a big, giant grid of all the possible combinations of those values. This is the only time I'm going to talk about a cross-join. The use of it is very niche. Uh, often it's when you're trying to do a matrix. So if you don't know what a matrix is, imagine you're trying to take a sp you're creating a spreadsheet of all the possible combinations of values inside those that join. It creates a lot of data. That's a full join. 
How often do you use them? Not very often. They're specialty applications. Now, there's two ways of explaining to people how joins work. The traditional way is to use Venn diagrams. Today I'm going to use a Venn diagram. Next week when I start talking about left and right joins, I'll be using a color-coded table instead. And that's because I had a prof once come to me and said, you know the right way to teach joins is to use colored boxes instead of Venn diagrams. And I go to him, why would that be? And he goes, because Venn diagrams are about sets, not about combining data. It's about sets, which means that's when you do unions, intersects, and accepts, as opposed to joining two tables. But sometimes a Venn diagram does the job also. And if I can get this to actually come up to the next slide, inner join. The inner join is the most common type of join. 95% of the joins, you'll, more than that, 98% of the joins you'll write in your life are inner joins. It returns records that match in both tables. In other words, it shows you the overlap between the two tables. Where are things overlapping? That's what it's going to give back to you. There's two syntaxes. So if you go Googling on the internet for how to do a join in SQL, you'll often see this syntax that I just highlighted, and it's going to go away. So this one. What does this syntax offer? It's the old syntax back in the day. This is actually how I learned how to do joins. Just so you know, this is what I learned. We got the modern syntax for joins, you know, late 90s. Um, it, this works, except you can't do left and right joins in most database servers with it. You can in Oracle, because Oracle's the one that came up with left and right joins. And you have to use this weird asterisk business where you put an asterisk. Let's say I want to do a left join, I put an asterisk here. If I want to do a right join, I put an asterisk here. So I'm actually moving an asterisk around somewhere in the where clause. And it got really messy fast. The modern approach is from some table, join the other table on, and then you tell it what the point of commonality is between the two tables. And by the way, the word inner is optional. So instead of from A, inner join B, you can just go from A, join B. If you don't include the word inner, it assumes it's an inner. And just a little bit additional notes before I start doing demonstrations to actually show you guys how this works. Number one, you don't have to join from primary key to foreign key. You can join from any two columns to your heart's content. No limits what you can join what to what as long as the same data type. Is it going to give you the answers you want? Probably not. And by the same token, as somebody demonstrated to me this morning, you can join the same column to itself. And the guy got basically a cross join because of it. You can join as many tables as you want. You're not limited to one join. You go from table, join, then another table, join another table, join another. You can join as many tables as you want. It makes no difference. Aliases are a good way of shortening the table names because after a while it's going to get messy. Um, if tables have duplicate field names, such as ID and name, you have to t prefix the table name to the field or the alias, such as this. And I'm going to actually do all this in a moment to show you guys what it does. Here we go. So we know that orders has order lines. Actually, I'm going to go customers have orders. I'm just going to reduce my data set a little bit. So. Uh, I'm going to retrieve my customers. 10,000 rows. Hot damn. I'm going to retrieve all my rows from orders. Now, traditionally, before we actually had joins, and there was a time before we had joins, what would happen is we would have to retrieve both lists and process them using a program. So we'd loop through the orders, and for every order, we'd loop through every single order line, finding all the order lines that match the order, extract those, next, next, next. That was before my time, just putting it out there. But there was once a time that's how it was done. Then they came up with joins, which allows you to extract the data somewhat more nicely. So I'm going to extract the name from 
the customers and the order date from orders. Once again, if I do this, I'll get all the customers. If I do this, I get all the order dates, but I have no idea what's connected to who. So what we need to use is a join. So we're going to join orders to customers. Because we know customers have orders, and orders must have a customer. You have to tell it what the point of commonality is. And 95% of the time, 98% of the time, you're going to go from a primary key to a foreign key. Now, if you guys remember what ThinkCube looks like, the orders have a column called customer ID. The customers have a primary called key called ID. Therefore, the ID found in customer ID in orders is the primary key of customers. So if I went like this, and I'm going to get rid of this. Like that. I'm going to go run. And now I've got each person and when they placed an order. No, it doesn't. No, you designed it with a foreign key. This is the side where you actually explicitly tell it. Now, you have to, like, Postgres is actually pretty clever, and it actually has a special kind of join that automatically detects relationships. Postgres and Oracle have it. Maybe Microsoft SQL Server has it now. I know for a fact Teradata doesn't have it, My, uh, MySQL doesn't have it, SAP doesn't have it, Firebird doesn't have it, SQLite doesn't have it. Because the relationship is there to enforce the rules of how the data goes in and how the data is treated has nothing to do with how you extract the data out of the database. So you have, you're better off assuming the lowest common denominator. And that's actually a rule you're going to learn in your system designs class. You should always assume the lowest common denominator for everything you do. In other words, assume your end user has the IQ of a turnip, and therefore assume the database server or the application you're writing is the dumbest thing on earth, and it doesn't know how to do anything on its own, so you explicitly tell it what the rules of engagement are. It's a bit like once I used an example, I think it was last week, where you told your significant other to go get you a beer, and they come back with a, with a Milwaukee an old Milwaukee. It's not beer, it's piss water. It's American beer. On the other hand, you know, if you told them, well, go get me a nice uh, microbrew, you know, you, you were more precise in what you wanted. Assume you have to be precise with everything you do. A common mistake I'll see with this is people will write like this because they just say, oh, I'm just going to join across the primary keys because, you know, ID is equal to ID. And what's really cool is, in this case, it won't work because I set up this database, so it won't work. It will work if you have overlapping IDs. But like I said, I set up this database, so you can't do that, at least from customers to orders, because I made sure the IDs were offset from each other. I was thinking. Make sure you connect to the right columns. Boom. And now it's running. Now. Let's just say, not only do I want to have the name and the order date, maybe I want the order number, which is also the order ID. So I'm going to put in ID. Here comes an error message. Column reference ID is ambiguous because there's more than one. The database parser doesn't know which ID you want. And it's not going to try to take a guess at which one you want. It's going to say, Dude, I can't do this. I need more precision. And remember on the slide? Down here I talked about if there's duplicate field names being returned, that you have to prefix it with a table name. Then in this case, I want the order ID. So I can go orders.id. And now I'm going to get the person's name, their order number, and the date the order was placed on. Kind of cool. It does what it does, and that's how you do a join. Now, 
Earlier I was talking about aliases to make your table names shorter. Um, I've got to actually see if, this, if the word as is going to work here. Okay, good. Um, on MySQL, it doesn't want you to put the word as. So I, could, I just couldn't remember off the top of my head. MySQL doesn't like you putting the word as here. I don't know why, but it doesn't. Uh, maybe the latest versions do, but as of you know a year ago, it didn't. Um, yeah, what I'm doing is I'm renaming customers as C. So I'm giving it a short name. I'm giving it a nickname. And when you rename it using an alias, it's only for the runtime of the query. You're not renaming it permanently. You're temporarily renaming it. Right? So it's as if I rename Chad here to M for Moonbeam. Or A for American. Right? Or B for Beard. Well, I, although I got a conflict on that one because I got two beards and a bad goatee. But, you know, I'm using examples here. I'm picking on these guys today. I don't know why instead of Speed 6 I'm picking on these guys. <laughs> you know, it just happens these guys got my attention today. Um, but I'm using that as an example of an alias. I've temporarily renamed you for, for just the runtime of the class to M for Moonbeam. It allows you to have shorter names. Later tomorrow, uh, later tomorrow, next week, I'll be explaining why aliases are actually even more important than that. But at the very basics, that is the important pieces of it. Now, the other piece I'm going to show you guys, since I talked about aggregates, is I'm going to show you guys how the aggregates behave with a join. Uh, like I said, I'm going to go over joins much more next week, but I want to give you guys enough meat recorded to help you with Lab 8. And let's just say I don't care about the order ID and the order ID. I just want to know how many orders the people placed. That's an important one. We want to know who the big spenders are, who spends money at the store all the time. I could actually go... Like that. Oh. Once I rename the table, you can't use its old name. You have to use its its alias. Bang. So now I've got this person placed four orders. Much more useful use of an aggregate. Now you know who spent the most placed the most orders. And you can see some people placed a lot of orders like such. Now we can get even fancier. Now I'm going to throw in some order lines. Now I'm grabbing customers, orders, and order lines. Just to show you guys that you can join as many tables as you want your heart's content. Act theoretically now I could actually go join product versions and I could go join the products and actually extract which products the person bought. I can just keep drilling down by adding more information that I'm retrieving from, which also takes account the more you're pulling from, the more overhead you're expecting out of it. So, you know, the more data you're working with, the slower it's going to get. Close enough. And go. Okay, now, here's the number it's giving me. For example, Alicia placed nine orders and spent $2,000 across all nine orders. How fast did that run? 370 milliseconds. I can guarantee that if you were to track that out of the database and then run write a program to do it, your program would run slower than that. It's a significantly smaller piece of information to work with. And the, right now I'm dealing with, what is it, 40,000 customers and like 80,000 orders and 114,000 rows of order lines. And it ran in less than half a second. So this is actually, this right now, this example right here shows you everything you need to know to be able to do three quarters of lab eight. So this is everything you need for lab seven and three quarters of lab eight was demonstrated today. Right. 
right there. No problem. Actually, if I make everything uppercase, I'm a little bit inconsistent, which makes it hard to read. And the other thing you're not getting very well on the projector is the, the keywords are blue, but it's not really showing up very well as blue. Does it show up well as blue? Well, for me, here it looks all gray, so I'm, I'm going to the assumption it was gray. Okay, so this, like I said, this is everything you need to finish Lab 7, and about half of Lab 8, maybe two-thirds of Lab 8. Next week, I'll give you everything else you need for Lab 8. Now, that having been said, last week's lecture plus this week's lecture plus uh, last week, this week, and next week gives you everything you need for the practical exam. So, three lectures covers everything you need for the practical exam. Labs 7 and 8 cover pretty much everything you need for the practical exam. Oh, sorry, practical test. Not allowed to use the word exam. It covers, it's the same test. <laughs> Just saying, it's the same one. I can't make it any easier than it is. I can make it a lot harder, but I can't make it easier. Last week's lecture plus this week's lecture plus next week's lecture gives you everything you need for the practical test. Labs 7 and 8 is everything you need for the practical test, practical-wise. Uh, next week, I'm handing out assignment 2, just so you know. What do you need for assignment 2? Are you ready for it? Last week's lecture, this week's lecture, and next week's lecture. And lab seven and eight. Do you see a pattern here? So these three weeks are the core for the second half of your term. So if you weren't paying attention there, Moonbeam, sorry, dude. You're going to have to watch the recording. So that's the situation there. He'll be watching it on YouTube. And I can honestly say this is the most terse version of this lecture I've ever done. Like there's not a lot of extra meat on it. Um, but next week, what am I going to be covering? I'll be reviewing joins one more time. I'll be showing how to do left and right joins. I'll be covering subqueries, which sucks in its own way. But some people like subqueries. Some people prefer doing a subquery over doing a join because they like putting in a drywall screw with a sledgehammer. I've actually had a student that did every single question using subqueries instead of using joins. Why? Because it made more sense to him. But his queries ran three times slower than everybody else's. Hey, you can get the drywall screw into the wall with a sledgehammer, but it's a excessive force. And uh, I'm probably going to be hitting up, if time permits, uh, set operations, which is unit, intersect, and accept. Usually I can cover that topic in 10 minutes, which I think is the end of lab 8, if I remember right. So time permitting, you'll get the last three questions of lab eight, I should be able to cover it in 10 minutes. It's really simple. If you understand sets for math. If you don't understand math sets, well, you might have a problem. Okay, um, pulling the plug here, 